Matt Monroe, live in Hong Kong, 1962. Released for the first time anywhere, Matt's complete concert recorded for the Operation Santa Claus charity is presented alongside an interview taped prior to the concert and rare radio recordings. See the links in the YouTube or Mixcloud description for more details. Yesterday All my troubles seem so far away Born free As free as the wind blow from Russia With love I fly to you There could never be A portrait of my love To my mind She's my kind of girl This is the life Here's where the living is Come with us, run with us We're gonna change the world You'll be amazed, so full of praise When we've rearranged your world We're gonna change your world Hello, I'm Michelle Monroe and welcome to the third of four very special programmes on one of England's most underrated singers of the 1960s. From a poverty-stricken upbringing in war-torn Britain to a steady rise to fame as a beloved entertainer, this series is an intimate portrait of the man behind the voice. Drawing on previously unbroadcast interviews, extremely rare recordings previously thought lost, and interviews with his family and friends, this is Matt Monroe, the boy from Shoreditch. At the end of 1965, Matt received an offer that would change everything and turn him into an international star. Matt's wife, Mickey, and road manager, Bob West, explain more. First of all, we got an offer from Reprise Records, which was Sinatra. And we said, oh, we better not do that. (laughs) (laughs) You know, he's likely to sign Matt up and flatten him. (laughs) Um... Because we didn't know at the time that actually Sinatra admired Matt, and he really did. Matt was very upset when he heard one day that Nat King Cole had died, because he had met him and he admired him a lot. Then out of the blue, Capitol Records got in touch and said, we would like to sign Matt Monroe to come and be on our label. It was at the stage in those days where Capitol Records, which is who Nat and I both recorded for, but I recorded for the English counterpart of Capitol. And Nat died, and there was nobody on the Capitol label at that time that could was doing that sort of material. I don't say could, but was doing Nat's sort of middle-of-the-road type material, as we call it. And I was asked to go to America to sort of take over, as it were, doing this sort of material. And... Uh, I went, and unlike British companies, American companies are very fond of paying what they call advances. And they paid me a very substantial advance, which was hugely publicised in the press over here. Matt Monroe signs a million dollar contract. And I did. I signed a million dollar contract. Over seven years, if you lasted. (laughs) (laughs) This is the life. Here's where the living is This is the life Baby, you're there This is the life You've waited long enough Girl, you've arrived Breathe in that air Wine and perfume The reprise offer was a big blow, as it could have given Matt the opportunity to record with Sinatra, and the offer came with the added bonus of making a film, but the powers that be felt that it might be a ruse by the company to stop his recording career, as once signed to a label, you are their property for the length of the agreement. But the capital offer was a different kettle of fish. This was the opportunity that could open new doors and give Matt the chance to work with some of the people he most admired, including Billy May, Sid Feller, Woody Herman and Jack Benny. But before starting his new contract, Matt had to tie up some contractual loose ends, one of which was a tour to the Philippines. Mickey takes up the story. 
when Matt first went to the Philippines, his uh, gig, for want of a better word, had finished the night before and they'd had a lot to drink. Nearly missed the plane, got on the plane, felt like death. And they got to the Philippines, went to leave the plane and Matt said, who on earth is on this plane? He said, look at those people out there. Can you believe that? Not realising they'd come for him. And here he is, not shaven, hung over, <laughs> bleary eyed. And they've strewn these flowers all over the tarmac which say, welcome Matt. He told me he'd been booked to do this one show in the Coliseum. I said, the Coliseum? Are you crazy? And the next thing I knew is I had a telegram to say, been held over for another four nights, 26,000 a night, sold out. Matt didn't know it at the time, but the 130,000 people he performed to had discovered his music in an unusual way, as the singer explained when he hosted a radio special in 1978. One of the most exciting professional moments of my life was in the Philippines, when I was invited to the Philippines to do some concerts there. And I was quite amazed because I'd never been to the Philippines, I didn't really know much about the Filipino people. And I expected them not to speak English naturally, although, like most English people, I expect all foreigners to speak English, because we can't be bothered to learn their languages. And when I got to the Philippines, I was quite amazed because we played in a place called the Araneta Coliseum, which, and we had, we played to 27,000 people per show, which quite amazed me. But what I didn't know, part of the reason for my success over there was because I'd recorded a beautiful song called Walk Away. And it was the year of elections when Mr. Macapagal was the outgoing president, and Mr. Ferdinand Marcos was the incoming president. What I didn't know was that uh, the Marcos faction had adopted Walk Away as their signature tune against Mr. Macapagal and they retitled it Alish Jan, which is Tagalog, which is the Filipino dialect. And to this day, I haven't really found out what Alish Jan means, and I'm sure it's not very complimentary. Walk away, please go. Before you throw your life away, a life that I could share for just today. We should have met Some years ago For your sake I say Alice Jan Please go Walk away and live Matt singing Walk Away at the Araneta Stadium when he returned in January 1966 for more sold-out concerts. That second trip was no less eventful. I got arrested over there. Uh, arrested? You, you, not well, kidding. no, I'm not kidding. I had my passport taken away and everything. For what? Uh, well, it was, they took an, an action against me. Oh, oh, I heard about that. Yeah, that's right. it was financial action. Mm -hmm. Well, a breach of contract, actually, you know, and uh, then they tried to, it was a civil action, and they said they couldn't hold me, and then they took out a thing with perjury. And that became a, um, a police action, and they wouldn't let me leave. And one thing. But it all turned out very well in the end. It just meant that I had to stay an extra week in the Philippines, which I didn't mind, but um, my contract had expired, and I was paying for myself. <laughs> he may have been detained for a while, but it didn't stop him making fun of the event. Denny, there was nothing for me funny about last week. There's going to be nothing funny about this week either, I tell you. This I believe. Yeah, things like, uh, here's a singer whose record was released before he was. <laughs> no comment. Oh, I see. What about you won't open a letter if it's in a manila envelope? That's it. As you said, there is going to be nothing, nothing funny, funny about this, this week, week. Yeah. yeah. Matt, uh, I told you we would like to hear. Could we hear your latest record? Yes. Um, January the 12th. Arrested on suspicion. Um, no, no, I know that. I mean, your last one. My last record? Yeah. January the 10th, arrested <laughs> on suspicion. The singer on a long thought lost recording of Parade of the Pops, 19th of January 1966. With the ink still drying on his Capitol recording contract, Matt and Mickey readied the family for the move to Los Angeles. 
but he'd already made up his mind the move wouldn't be a permanent one. If I'm as successful as I hope to be, yeah, then uh, probably yes, I stay. So we could. I think we'll have to stay, you know. So we could be losing you. Not permanently, I don't uh. think so. You know, I was. I'm a Cockney. I'm born and bred <laughs> in London, mate. You know, yeah. and uh, I rather like it here. Yeah, good. Um, but you have to go where the work is. Sure. Yeah. Just days before their flight to California, Capitol Records arranged for Matt to record his first single for them at Abbey Road. Little did he know at the time that the song he was to record was one that he would always be associated with. Born free, as free as the wind blows, as free as the grass grows, born free to follow your heart. Live free, and beauty surrounds you. The world still astounds you It's time you look at a star Yes, this is a song written by John Barry, also, as I said, mm -hmm. by Don Black, who is my manager. A beautiful film about, strangely enough, about a lioness. Mm -hmm. And uh, John Barry, uh, who wrote the music, phoned me and said, would I like to sing the song in the movie? Which, of course, I said yes, with a, with a storyline like this. Mm -hmm. well, and it's got to be a guaranteed successful film. Um, we did the song in the film, and it had a royal premiere at home with the Queen, and uh, I was invited to the royal premiere. Matt was very disappointed uh, when he went to the premiere of Born Free and it wasn't there. Don Black. Carl Foreman, the... Uh, well, the producer of the film, actually, he didn't like the song that much. He thought it was wrong for the picture. He said um, he thought the song should be more about cages and lions, and I made a social comment of it. And uh, he didn't like the melody either. And uh, so when Matt went to the premiere of it, it was a raw premiere, uh, the song was not in the film, because Carl Foreman took it out. So that was a very, very disappointing evening for me except that I got to meet the Queen anyway for the first time. Mm -hmm. And uh, then it came over here, the film came over here. And, uh, for a long time, the soundtrack wasn't included in the film. My, my soundtrack wasn't included in the film. But what happened was that Roger Williams, a pianist, uh, an American pianist, recorded it and it went, so it became such an instant hit in America. It became number one, Roger Williams Orchestra and Chorus. And Carl Foreman and the people behind it, the Columbia Pictures, you know, they said, you've got to get this in the film because it could get an Oscar nomination. The only thing that upsets me a great deal is the fact that it wasn't a hit in, in America for me. It was a hit by Roger Williams. With Roger Williams' orchestral version sitting at the top of the American charts, that was the manner from heaven that Columbia Pictures couldn't ignore. They could see dollar signs, but there was a slight problem. For a song to be eligible for an Academy Award, it has to feature in every print of the film. Subsequently, the heads of Columbia fought to reclaim every piece of celluloid that had been distributed so as to put the song back in. Matt had been devastated when producer Carl Foreman had blatantly lied to him at the premiere, saying the song had been taken out because the film was fractured during transport, but it was nothing compared to what came next. While his manager Don Black flew to Hollywood for the Oscars, Matt sat in England as he'd not been invited to the ceremony or to sing the song that featured in the nominated film on that historic night. Both the song and Barry's score won Academy Awards. Don sent Matt a photograph of the moment he'd been handed the Oscar by Dean Martin. It said, If it wasn't for you, I wouldn't be in this picture, Donzy. It left a bitter taste in his mouth, and that was the moment when a small stab of resentment started to creep in over Don's managerial commitment. He felt that the lyricist was so wrapped up with the possibility of winning an Oscar himself that he'd overlooked pushing for his client's appearance in the show. Instead, Roger Williams took centre stage. Although other songs had propelled Matt into a worldwide market, nothing prepared him for the success of Born Free. It became one of the most successful songs of the century, 
and despite popular belief, the classic never charted in the UK. The success came from further afield, with the track soaring to the number one position in Australia, in Singapore, the Philippines and the Jamaican hit parade. The lyrics were a metaphor for freedom, and political and religious leaders the world over hooked on to its subliminal message, with one African nation adopting it as its national anthem. The song Born Free will always be associated with Matt Monroe. Like the Beatles, Matt's voice was to become the international sound of 60s Britain. In the wake of Bond, he was to become Hollywood's king of the movie soundtracks, reaching a massive worldwide audience who might otherwise never have heard his music. By May of 1966, Matt and his family were based in California. My wife and I, we, we love uh, California. We enjoy life there very much indeed. Um, the kids love it. My, my daughter is going to an American school now for the first time. She's only been there about six or eight weeks. And she's out of her mind. She thinks it's the greatest thing that ever happened. My boy seems very happy there. So if um, my agents um, come up with enough work to keep me working in America, then I'll be happy to stay. Because we lived out in a place called the San Fernando Valley. It's a lovely suburb. It's about 26 miles outside of Los Angeles in the desert. Yeah. Um, beautiful weather. We rented a ranch house style home with a huge pool and yeah. orange trees in the garden and beautiful gardens and everything. You know, and it was unbelievable. It was so beautiful. With the Monroe's luggage barely unpacked, Matt was called into the studio to record 16 songs over a four day period. Capital had no intention of letting their new signing settle in, and the ever industrious Mickey was left trying to make their house into a home, kissing her husband goodbye so he could fulfil various engagements back in the UK before being rushed back into the studio as soon as his plane landed back in LA. This time, another 13 tracks. That's 29 songs recorded in six weeks. Matt wasn't happy with a lot of the recordings made in America and felt as if the songs were being churned out on a conveyor belt. Get them out and sell them quick. I think because they were thrown together, there wasn't the care and thought taken over them as there is in this country, which may be slower, but I think is much more efficient, much more professional, and the end product proves the worth of spending this time making an album. To Matt's relief, his next recording saw him back on familiar ground at EMI Studios with George Martin. George had left EMI and set up his own production company, Associated Independent Recording, or Air, as it became more familiarly known throughout the business. This gave George the advantage of still producing Matt, even though he was now contracted to Capital, something George couldn't have done as head of Parlophone. This session was for another movie theme, with John Barry once again at the helm, and lyrics by Matt David. The film was the Quiller Memorandum, and the song, Wednesday's Child. Wednesday's Child is a child of woe Wednesday's child cries alone I know when you smiled just for me you smiled for a while I forgot I was when Wednesday's child Wednesday's child Born to be was much happier with the session and jumped on a plane for a tour of Australia and a TV special for Channel 7 in Sydney. As well as his better known songs, he'd also sang a number he'd had a hand in himself. I'm a pommy, one of those English guys, yes, I'm a pommy, a little bit undersized. A rare occasion when the EastEnder received the song's writing credit. He was always proud of his roots, 
You can take the boy out of Shoreditch, but not Shoreditch out of the boy. Now Cockney is the only language that I speak. I'm trying hard to become acclimatised, but I just can't help being anglicised. I'm longing for that fog to come on down Cause I'm a pommy from London town Although I miss good old Piccadilly I'll take King's Cross and Taylor Square From Wollongong to Wagga Wagga They laid a welcome mat everywhere Yes, on the pommy I hope you don't mind me It's getting late now Time for that cup of tea But don't laugh, folks Cause if you look up your family tree It worked so well in Australia that he sang another version for his American audience titled I'm a Limey. That's right, it's I'm a Limey. I'm a Limey. Have yeah. you recorded that? No. You haven't? No, and I'm not Gee, going to. Oh, that's a shame. I think it's... Well, it's, it's one of those things, uh, John, you've heard the punchline of the yes. song now. Uh-huh. Sure. It's a piece of material which we use in the act to explain that I'm not American, I am from England. Mm-hmm. And it has a punchline. I think if we record it, it's like telling a gag twice. Yes, that's To the true. same audience. Have you r- written any songs yourself? No, I wish I had. I could have made a lot of money. <laughs> But I can't write songs. It's as simple as that. Songwriting was a talent he envied. And he'd also been credited with the song back in 1961 under his original name, Terry Parsons. I can't think what it is now. I dream of you. Oh, I dream of you, yeah, till I can dream no more. Yeah. Do you have any 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 uh, intention of writing any more songs? I'd love to, Ray, honestly, but uh, I don't seem to have that talent. I really don't. You don't have the time? No, I don't have the talent. <laughs> I'm being very modest. honest. <laughs> no, I'm not being modest. I'm being very honest. I wish I could. There's a lot of money in songwriting. But um, I, I really don't have the talent to write songs. Um, I've tried. All right, so it worked once. But that's about it. You know, I, I, and I've sat down many times with tape recorders and tried to compose. But that's not my forte, really. You know. other, other people write them, I'll go out and perform them. I'll dream of you Till I can dream no more until the stars above shine in the sky no more I'll dream of you until the seas run dry though you Refuse my love My dreams you can't deny Although you went away And broke my heart in two Until eternity I'll still remember you A million years from now My love I promise you If I can dream of love I'll dream of you There was good reason why Matt couldn't remember the tune. He didn't compose it. 
It was written by someone called Mark Dan, and Matt was given a writing credit in lieu of payment for recording it. The mysterious Mark Dan was also credited on I'm a Pommy, although this time Matt wrote a large proportion of the lyric himself. But who was Mark Dan? It was a mystery for a long time, but Monroe archivist Richard Moore has recently managed to unmask him. Mark Dan was a pseudonym for a man called Fred Jackson. He worked for Mills Music and just so happened to be Mickey Monroe's boss. Now, he evidently tried his hand at writing, but working for a music publisher himself, he couldn't use his own name. His pseudonym, I suspect, was a bit of a pun. He worked on Denmark Street, so he took Denmark, swapped the syllables and switched Den to Dan, and they've got Mark Dan. Matt's frustration with his new label continued later that year. In November, he had a residency at New York's Persian Room at the Plaza Hotel, and while in the city he went into Capitol Studios to record the album Invitation to Broadway. Unlike his albums of the past with huge orchestras or big bands, he wanted to pair it all back and gain a more intimate feel. Just five musicians made up the payroll, piano, bass, drums and two guitars. The session went like a dream, and feeling pleased with himself, Matt went back to work at the Persian Room. Unbeknown to the British singer, producer Dave Kavanagh decided that he wanted big orchestrations on the project and overdubbed the album with other instruments and extra brass. Matt went mad, not only because Kavanagh had butchered his tracks, but that it had been done so underhandedly. His dissatisfaction with the album caused Capital to leave it on the shelf for two years. Matt only relented when they released The Impossible Dream without his knowledge, and it proved popular. The whole situation still annoyed him years later, even if by then he'd forgotten it was a quintet and not a trio. In one case, we went to, I was in New York, and they came out there and we did an album with trio, just sort of head arrangements. And then they took them back to Los Angeles and then scored them. Hmm. Then did an arrangement around the trio that we already used. And added strings and brass and everything in California. Yeah, quite. Which, you know, is not really the right way to make an album. You don't even know the arrangers are. Hello, Dolly. Well, hello. It's so nice to have you back where you belong You're looking swell, Dolly And I can tell, Dolly You're still glowing, you're still crowing You're still going a beautiful version of Hello Dolly, as Matt wanted it to be heard without the overdubs from his 2020 release, Stranger in Paradise, The Lost New York Sessions, which jumped straight to the number eight spot in the official album charts and spent more than five months in the top 30 at the physical album charts. That wasn't the only story from Matt's New York residency. I was in New York at the time. I was working at the Persian Room in New York. And i never forget it because... I got the call from Lord Delphont, and would I do the Royal Command? Of course, you know, I said yes. This room we're sitting in here now is what's called the Hall of Fame at the London Palladium. Bob West. Now, Matt played the Palladium with Helen Shapiro in his very early days, but he also did the Sunday Night Palladium, and he also did a wonderful Royal Command performance. If you're asked to do the Royal Command performance, whether you're an American performer, whoever you are, you come. Uh, it's an honour. Um, it's the same as some of our performers go and sing for presidents in America. The plaza agreed to let me off for three days, a day to travel, do the show, and a day to get back. Plus the fact I had to put my own debt to do my job at the plaza, and the person that I got to replace me was getting more money than I was, so it cost <laughs> me money that way as well. <laughs> it was magic, because I shared a, a dressing room at the London Palladium, with Jerry Lewis, Sammy Davis Jr., Tommy yeah. Steele, Eric Nani. 
We all oh. shared the same destiny. As long as I'm singing, there's a bell up in my brain that is ringing, making a crazy ding dong. And this band don't deserve it, and there's nothing in the world to hurt me. I'll go on singing my song. Cause making music is more to me than a pleasure. A clip from a fan's recording of the 1966 Royal Command performance which, like so many of the singer's TV and radio appearances, no longer exists in the archives. Matt loved the evening, and performing for his country was something he dreamt about. His appearance that night was hailed as a great success, and it gave him the chance to kick back with his mate Sammy Davis Jr., who was also on the bill. But there was no time to bask in the aftermath of that magical evening. Matt was soon back on the flight that had winged him over less than 72 hours earlier to complete his stint at the Plaza Hotel. He completed the 6,000-mile trip, only missing one performance. In March 1967, Matt was in the studio again over a six-week period, this time to record 21 songs for the albums, Invitation to the Movies and These Years although those sessions did give him a chance to work with Billy May. Some of the stuff we did with Billy May, I enjoyed doing, and Sid Feller, I enjoyed doing very much. Because Billy's such a character, and it was mm -hmm. such a thrill to work with the guy, you know, he's, uh, he's a lovely guy. And uh, I enjoyed the thing, he did a nice thing on uh, Spanish Eyes. He also did Georgie Girl. And they were fun to do anyway, you know, mm -hmm. because you're working... I mean, I can't fault the musicians, because we had some great guys on the sessions, you know, some real knockout players. And so competent, it was ridiculous, you know, mm. just sit down and it's sight read and bang, and you got one in the can before you know where you are, you know. Mm. Blue Spanish eyes Teardrops are falling from your Spanish eyes Please, please don't cry this is just adios and not goodbye soon. I did uh, Spanish Eyes for him. Billy May. It wasn't a very big record, but he loved it because it was a completely different version. We did it at an up-tempo and with a Spanish rhythm, with a, with, actually with a Mexican rhythm. And uh, he loved it and the, and the band loved it. He carried his own... Uh, rhythm section with him. I remember he had a, a piano player who played phenomenally and a good good bass player and a good drummer. And I remember all three of those guys talked with a very heavy Cockney accent. And we had a lot of laughs with them. Blue Spanish eyes Prettiest eyes in all of Mexico Matt was in big demand during his American tenure, appearing on all the major television shows, including Ed Sullivan and Amazing Three Times. Living and working in LA gave him one of the biggest thrills of his life, sharing a stage with Jack Benny for two weeks at the Sahara in Las Vegas. The other fantastic memory is working at the Sands with uh, Jack Benny. I'm working on stage with him because I had to take part in his... Routine. Routine, you know, which was a knockout. He's, he's a thriller second, that man, mm. and a gentleman. In July, Matt was back in the UK. Always eager for the chance to team up with George Martin and Johnny Spence, he found himself in an unfamiliar CTS studio in Bayswater. By now, Matt had earned the tag King of the Movie Themes, and this session, Pretty Polly from the film A Matter of Innocence, gave him another to add to his list of celluloid credits. Although George's independence had the advantage of allowing them to use other studios, a clip from the session showed that there were disadvantages too. Keep we're still running. Let's go for one right, more right, right away, please. Get the brass out before they go to overtime. <laughs> Good or bad, this is it. I've got news for you. <laughs> when you're recording for American companies and you're paying your own expenses, you know, get them out. Listen to me, Polly, while you can You're a 
pretty Polly, ask any man Soon you will awake And you want to take the world That's when I'll lose you Wide-eyed pretty Polly Soon you'll be Worldly pretty Polly For all to see Youth lasts for a moment Hold on to that moment Spend your moment close to me During that same trip back to the UK, Matt also recorded a TV special with the great Nelson Riddle. As I said to you earlier, this is the first time I've had the opportunity of working with Nelson Riddle. It's long been an ambition of mine and tonight this ambition has been realised. But uh, he's been playing his music and I've been singing my songs and we haven't really got together on something between us. And I asked him, would he please write an arrangement, something special for me? And here is Nelson Riddle's special arrangement of Strike Up the Band! Let the drums roll out Let the trumpets call While the people shout Strike up the band Hear the cymbals ring Zing, 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 calling one and all To that happy swing Strike up the band And we'll all give a cheer as we stand To the man with the stick in his hand He's the man who's command of the band Makes the band And you can't go wrong With a happy song Hey, leader If nothing else, that trip proved one thing He wanted to go home I started getting very homesick, you know mm. And I had my two children, my mother-in-law, nanny, my wife And I just said, pack everything up, we're going home My wife went mad because she loves it over there and uh, we just packed up and came home. And I don't regret it. I enjoy this country. And we kept our house on here. Just closed it up for you. And that was the worst decision we ever made. Because otherwise he would have been ginormous. But <clears throat> Matt being as he was, he just said, oh, well, you know, who knows, we might not even be together if, if we'd stayed over there. So this is how it was probably meant to be. The children adored him and he adored them. He was proud of his children. And he was very proud of his son Mitchell from his first marriage and was very close to him. I mean, you know, if ever we were driving off to North London, he'd always pop in there and see him. He was very responsible for, for his family life and, and his relationship with Mickey and that. And I think that was another reason, maybe. There was never any scandal about him running off with another lady or, or something going wrong in the family. It was a family unit. That comes down to being a, a Londoner. Who, you come from a family and you, you stick to your family. You don't run away from it. Matt might have moved back to the UK, but it wasn't long before he was off on another world tour. Stopping off in South Africa, he wasn't happy about having to play to segregated audiences. He was totally against apartheid. Uh, we played mainly to whites. Um, then when we went to a place called Peter Maritzburg, that was a segregated audience. It was, um, it was, it was the white audience were downstairs and the coloured audience were upstairs. So I got my own back in my own little way by doing a, an all-coloured show where whites weren't allowed. Uh, all the guys in the hotel, the waiters, and one thing or another were saying to me, oh, Mr. Monroe, you know, it's terrible, you can't do a show for us. So I said, well, why can't we? And we did a show. Uh, a third show one evening, we went out and did a special show at a theatre, uh, all coloured. And it was a gas, it was beautiful. I enjoyed it so much, and it's probably the best audience I ever appeared for in South Africa. <laughs> Matt did indeed get his own back. He'd arrived in South Africa with a contract that stipulated that black people should be allowed to watch his concerts. But that wasn't the case. African Consolidated Theatre's regional manager, John Clark, issued a statement. It's a great pity that a permit couldn't be obtained because Mr Monroe is especially popular among the coloured people. 
but we tried very hard. The singer responded saying that he might not be feeling well enough to perform at all if an extra show was not arranged. He was told that the only way he would be allowed to sing to the black population was to give another concert after his contracted show in private and they wouldn't pay him for it. And when we were in South Africa, he did a big concert for the people in Cape Town. Bob West. And he was a, it was an old cinema we went and found. And it was funny, it was on a circle and it, it was like a isolated island in these streets. And they put all the speakers outside in case there was a crowd. It was a joke. It was crowded. In fact, over 1,000 people packed into the Gem Theatre at midnight and the loudspeakers hooked up in the streets entertained several thousand more. When he started singing Born Free, you could hear the roar from outside. He had to sing it four times, simply because they'd adopted it as their freedom song. The incident was never reported. Be quiet. Shh. Don't talk too loud. Why? My foot's gone to sleep. <laughs> Listen, what are we going to do? I think we should join my foot. Oh, I'm mad. No, no, come on. <laughs> sing a song. Well, do you mind if I change to No, you sit over there. This, this, is, this is not really me, you know. This is me, I think. <laughs> How do you? What do you say we lays the day away? Beautiful idea. Sit in a siesta session. Yawning is the best expression. Take it easy, talents ought to have their play. So, so what do you say we lays the day away? You got me hands now. I like the way that you walk by. I like the way you swing your eye. I like your kind of love. That's good, baby, that's good. Every night, I like the way you pick for more and linger there outside the door. I like your kind of love. That's good, baby, that's good. With a simple melody Just one single note is sounded And repeated constantly Well, my love is like a samba With that simple melody Just one single steady feeling That's repeated constantly In my love when you've gone and I'm all by myself And I need your caress I need to think of you And the thought of you holding me near Makes the loneliness soon disappear What may be the end thing in the new year? You for me are everything that she she Rescued audios from the Val Dunigan show, Piccadilly Palace with Bruce Forsyth and Millicent Martin, Scylla and meet Petula Clark. You have to have a good sense of humour to survive in the business, and Matt's was legendary. Helen Shapiro. And he was very goonish, uh, as I remember. He would just And he would do like impressions and silly voices and tell gags, just one after the other. Yeah, great sense of humour. The thing about Matt was that not only was he a great singer, but I think he was a would-be comedian as well. David Hamilton. And in his stage show, uh, he was always doing little bits of funny business and gags. And one thing I remember was he had quite a high stool, which he used to sit on. And he used to do this because he was very small. And he used to do this gag that he you know, didn't make it when he went to sit on the chair. And he'd do it two or three times before he finally got his bum on the chair. <laughs> And uh, it always got a good laugh. He had become great friends with comedian Dave Allen and they shared a similar sense of silliness. 
we were in the same town, and uh, he would sometimes come and see my show, and then, or I would go and see his show, and sometimes we'd actually get involved with each other. But as it happened, he'd come back, I think, from some Far East uh, tour, and he came on stage, and uh, he, sa he sang his kind of opening number, and then he started to talk, and then he explained, he said, ladies and gentlemen, he said, I've been to the Far East, and he said, you know, sometimes in the Far East, you, you eat something or you drink something which uh, affects your stomach, and you get what is called Montezuma's Revenge or the squits or whatever, whatever terminology you want to call it. And he said, there might, I, that's what I've got. He said, I've flown back in, that's what I've got, and there might be a time during the, the performance that I, I have to go, and if I go, you know what it is I've gone for. And that was that. People all laughed, and they thought, yeah, that's nice. And he, he sang, and he sang, and he sang, and he talked, and he talked, and he talked. And in the middle of one number, after about 25 minutes, he just said, excuse me, <laughs> and he went. And it is perhaps the biggest, most sustained laugh I have ever heard in the theatre. People were just... And when he came back on again, it started... And then any sort of innuendo, I mean, any sort of wording that had anything to do with eating or drinking or going or... You know, it just... It just it turned into, I mean, and I was thinking, you know, who's the comic here? He's, you know, this is a serious kind of romantic singer. And, uh, and he, was, he, was, he was very warm with an audience, wonderfully warm with the audience. Great character altogether. It wasn't long before the singer was invited to appear on Dave's TV show. An idea for one routine came to Dave whilst out with his friend. He was very funny. I mean, he was very dry. He was very funny. Um... He was the ultimate pro. He was just he was just a great, great character. We were sitting in a bar in Birmingham, and Matt had the most extraordinary long body and very short legs. But I'm sitting on the stool, and I'm, I know I'm kind of five inches bigger than Matt. And he's looking down on me while he's sitting on the stool. And I, I kind of straightened up. I thought I must be slouching, but he was still kind of towering over me. And I said, Matt, just hang on a second. Will you do me a favor? Just stand up. So I stood up, and he stood up, and I'm looking down on him. And it was one of those kind of things. I thought, what the hell is this about? Matt, stand up, will you? <laughs> <laughs> Sit down again, will you? This is supposed to be... <laughs> This is supposed to be a colour TV spectacular, right? It is. This is a terrible opening. What do you mean a terrible opening? Well, it was a terrible opening. Dave, ladies and gentlemen. Ladies and gentlemen, Dave Allen. You're sitting there. Ladies and gentlemen, my guest this evening, Tam Ornom. What was that? Was it? <laughs> Tam Ornom. Ornom? And I walk on nothing. No music, nothing at all. You didn't like it? I didn't like it. This is a spectacular, Dave. You're the star of the show. You can have anything you want when you're doing your own show, when you're doing a spectacular. They told me I could have a big singer. <laughs> You've got a big singer. Yeah, sitting down I got a big singer, <laughs> but not standing up. Sadly, the comedy routine with the stool is all that survives of Matt's appearances on Dave's TV shows. His height was always the punchline of many a joke, but never his vocal talent, as Bob Monkhouse remembers. He was a cheeky boy when he was a little boy, and he was a cheeky young man, and he was a cheeky big man. And Well, he was never a big man. He was too short to dunk a biscuit. But when he was on stage, he seemed to grow in stature. The more that great big voice came out of that small, compact figure, the bigger the man seemed to be. But that wasn't the end of his acting ambition. I was, I was doing a um, series for the BBC, and I wanted Matt on the show. And I was trying to do different things with television at the time. I was trying to kind of introduce not just a singer to be a singer. I wanted a singer to be something else. And uh, I wanted to kind of chat to him and kind of have some sort of conversation. So this is the way we started it off. And, uh, and I devised this idea that, you know, what do singers think about when they're singing? Because if you sing a song a hundred times or a thousand times, you know, you can't actually think she's the most wonderful woman in the world, whatever. You know, you're not, you can't be thinking that all the time. So we devised, we wrote this kind of thing as, as he sang one of his songs. We'd recorded it behind it, all the kind of things that the problems that were worrying him, you know, like uh, all the things that he liked. He thought, There's a nice looking woman in the front row there, you know, then she the, must remember to pay the mortgage. And what did I do with the car? Where did I park the car? All those kind of things that were going on un underneath all this, this wonderful romantic words. And then he played, uh, we, we'd written a sketch 
in which he had, around a television program which was done at the time called The Power Game. And uh, he played this part, and he was actually wonderful in it. Patrick Weimark. Patrick Weimark. And he, uh, and he looked exactly like Patrick Weimark, too. And he played it, and, he, and <clears throat> when he came off, he said, he said, that's one of the best experiences I've ever had in my life. He said, that was great. He said, I really, I really want to act now. And I think he actually always did want to act somewhere along the line. I did a movie with George Montgomery and Tippi Hedren years ago, <laughs> uh, Satan's Harvest. I was excellent. As often happened, the offer of the part didn't come through usual channels. And I was in Australia. I got a call from the desk. There's a Mr Montgomery down here to see us. Well, I don't know Mr Montgomery. What does he want? He said, well, he's George, he said, it's George Montgomery. You'll know him. I said, is he an American? He said, yes. I said, is he a guy about six foot nine? <laughs> he said, well, he's a big fella. I said, you don't know George Montgomery, the actor? He said, no. So I said, send him up. And sure enough, knock on the door open. There's this giant of a man. He walked in. He said, hi. I said, hi. He said, how'd you like to be in a movie? I said, I'd love to, but I can't act. I've never acted in my life. He said, don't worry about that, I'm the director. And he threw me a script and he said, uh, pick out a part you like. I read the script and I said, I'll have the part of Bates because there's only one line in it. <laughs> I thought, well, I can't get in too much trouble with that. So he went away and rewrote the script. So it ran, runs all the way through the film. Does a child forget when he has a birthday Does a rose forget when it's spring You make this stuff? No, wife. She gets all the leftovers, puts them together and she figures when I'm bombed I won't know the difference anyway. Uh, sure tastes like. <laughs> it's not bad once you get used to it. How is your family? Growing. Eight. In eight years? It's that long off seasons, you know. You better get yourself another hobby. Cutter. Closer, closer. You stick with your hobbies, and I'll stick with mine. I see it. Two people with our hopes so high. No one has loved as you and I. Could I forget the love we know? Because of one good Two people, the theme from Satan's Harvest. Matt absolutely loved his time filming in South Africa and George Montgomery immediately offered him another script for his next movie in the Philippines, but filming had to be suspended as the country suffered 10 earthquakes with a magnitude of 7.1. Sadly, the opportunity never presented itself again. Matt was still recording for Capital, but the pace had thankfully slowed down somewhat when a South American entrepreneur made him the offer to record in Spanish, something his Capital predecessor Nat King Cole had also done. I, it was a thing that never crossed my mind, to sing in another language. And a very nice guy called Leonardo Schultz, believe it or not, who was South American. He came over and just simply came up to me and said, would I sing in Spanish? I said, well, I don't, see, I don't speak Spanish. It doesn't matter. And he took the old tracks that I'd already done, plus a couple of things that he'd written himself. And he wrote everything out phonetically in Spanish. Fortunately, I have a very good ear, and we got halfway through this album, we're doing the next number, and the, the guy that was teaching me said, no, 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 Matt, no. I said, what, what is it wrong? He said, you speak too good, you go ah. back to Cockney. <laughs> the charm of Matt's Cockney Spanish recordings made him extremely popular throughout the Latino market. His first album, Al Gwen Canto, sold seven million copies in as many days and gave the singer his first platinum disc. Peter Jameson was working for EMI Spain and became his Spanish representative. I've gone to Matt Monroe concerts in various parts of the world, but on tour in Spain was what we did, and we did it 
1969, we did it in 1970, we did it in 1971. As he recorded more Spanish material, as he became just incredibly popular. Um, and we drifted across all of Spain. It became so big and so important for EMI, uh, I was taken off any permanent duties I may have had, and I was simply Matt Munro's or almost the alter ego. He did the singing, I did the press, I did the PR. I was, I was a young kid, I was hosting press conferences. There were people besieging Matt everywhere he went. All the young girls in Spain were absolutely crazy about Matt Romero because of this strange, unusual English charm and the fact he had bothered to spend time recording his songs in Spanish for them. Libre Igual que el viento A veces pretendo Que sea siempre tu amor Libre Que nada te obligue Que al fin si me sigues Lo hagas De You've been listening to part three of Matt Monroe, the boy from Shoreditch. Next week, hear how Kenny Everett caused a protest song to become a turntable hit, how the same song would cause an irreversible riff with Capital, and the tragedies which nearly brought the British singer to his knees. The script was written and presented by Michelle Monroe and produced by Richard Moore. Hoy eres muy libre Te ama o negarme Felicidad This was a Minter Monroe production. If you'd like to know more about the life of Matt Monroe, you may also enjoy The Singer Singer, The Life and Music of Matt Monroe, a biography by Matt's daughter, Michelle. Also available is Words and Music, an abridged audio version of the biography, along with rare audio clips and video performances on a custom-made USB memory stick. See the links in the YouTube or Mixcloud description for more details. Take my hand. Stranger in Paradise, The Lost New York Sessions the critically acclaimed Top 10 album. Matt Munro's Broadway sessions released for the first time in their original form. Also includes a bonus disc featuring 27 of Matt's best recordings, including Born Free, Portrait of My Love and Walk Away. See the links in the YouTube or Mixcloud description for more details.